Thank you. For that. Oh. Hello. We can see people. How good is that? About a year and a half ago, Alex Timmis, my colleagues, and I, and the rest of our group at the Mopco Improv Theater, started a podcast. We knew we were starting it improvisationally. We didn't have a lot of skills, to be transparent. <laughs> and we weren't exactly sure what it was going to be. But we started it with a premise. And the premise was this, that the skills and philosophies and approaches of improvisation didn't just live within the walls of our theater or even uh, within the highly structured um, bodies of work that we were doing in, imp uh, in organizations and weren't just to be trotted out in structured form uh, for training purposes, but that they could also be found organically out in the wild, just in life. And we thought, let's go looking for them. Let's explore them. We named our podcast Dare to be Human because we wanted to seek out those principles and find them and reflect this human experience and that it took courage and it took vulnerability and that there was something a little daring about showing up and living these principles that we professed, like uh, focusing on your partner instead of yourself, or celebrating failure, or saying yes and to whatever offers presented themselves in the moment without pre-planning and being able to control everything. We also wanted to name it Dare to be Human because it sounds a lot like um, Brene Brown's writings. <laughs> and we want her to find us and to sue us. <laughs> because it will increase our visibility. <laughs> Brene, we dare you to sue us. <laughs> so... We, uh, we, we decided to not only uh, provoke Brene Brown, but to uh, begin all of our episodes by asking either our guests or one of our amazing uh, hosts to uh, begin with a dare to be human story. Um, some examples of people we've spoken with before. Uh, John Register uh, is a Paralympic athlete who talks about uh, his encounter with Michelle Obama and them becoming friends. Uh, Michaela Bly is a renowned storyteller, formerly of The Moth. Um, she tells a story of a triumphant and healing return to middle school, which is something I think all of us can only dream of and imagine what that would be like. Um, and, and our very own Jeff Katzman has uh, spoken to us and told us a, a, a human story about connecting with an Uber driver who is trying to learn more about empathy. So enough of talking about what we talk about when we talk about things on our podcast. We figured we would do our very first live broadcast of the podcast here on this stage at the AI conference. Woo. And we have asked uh, Gabe Mercado to help us out. So please welcome Gabe. Gabe, do you have a dare to be human story for us? I, I do. I I'm do. so glad That's you fair. said that. We wouldn't have known what to do if you said no. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like you to, to take you back to the year um, 2006. And um, at that time, I was actually married for five years. And I had, I had um, unexpectedly found out through friends that uh, my wife was actually having an affair. And I was totally crushed. Um, by that, uh, being brought up, you know, very traditionally male. Um, it was a huge blow to my, to my ego. And I was sharing with my friends how crushed I was and how surprised I was at suddenly being a single parent. She had left us. Um, and I was sharing with friends. And we were walking down the street. And um, we passed by this place where a band was playing. And the band was familiar because it was the band of the man she had an affair with. And so I said, look, his band is playing. And my friends were all with me. And I said, let's go in. <gasps> and this was just like a month after it happened. So I walk in. Um, and he had a very good band, but they were not popular. So there was no <laughs> audience. I walk in. And this is the stage. I walk where uh, 
to where Marion is. And I just stood there in front. I stood there and I had a bag. As you can see, I like bags. So I had a big bag. I had a sling bag in front. And it was the last song. And I go up on stage right after the last song. I go, he's, he's packing up. I go up on stage and say, hello, you know me. <laughs> and he put his hands up immediately, looked at my bag and said, is that a gun? Do you have a gun? Are you going to kill me? And I said, <laughs> I, and then I had to make the decision to lie that it was a gun or just to assure him that it wasn't a gun. So I made the decision not to answer the question. And I told him, step outside. I'm going to talk to you. And so I had a conversation. He was saying, you know, uh, I, she said you were in an open marriage and all of that. And, you know, I'm the victim here. He said, so what I did was I slapped him very playfully on the face. And I said, shush, me and my son, we're the victims. And then I walked away. I never told him I had no gun, <gasps> but just acted as if I had one. <laughs> And it was very empowering just to make somebody think that you had a gun and that you were willing to use it. That's my story. Oh. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> so, how... <laughs> I wish we had our 45 minutes of podcast to talk to you about this story. Thank you so much for your story. I guess my, one of my first questions is, how did that moment transform, transform that experience for you? Or what was different after that moment for you? Um, being, being left like that is one of the most emasculating experiences that, 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 that I had ever felt, that I felt, wow. Um, and it, apparently it was public knowledge, the affair. Uh, everyone knew except me. And so I was feeling less than human, less than male in the old, you know, construct of what a man should be. And I felt that just walking in and just standing in front of the stage helped me claim some of the, that I'm not going to be the one walking around in shame. <laughs> I'm going to reclaim it just by standing there. The bonus part was he thought that I, I was capable of violence. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I can give off that aura, so, yeah. <laughs> that there's something about the way other people see us and the stories they project onto us, which transforms our sense of ourselves and yeah. can re... I love that. I love the, the, two, the two moments, or two moments in that moment that are sticking out are when you uh, stood and just paused and didn't say anything the whole time and just looking at him, and then when he asked you, just pausing and not saying anything. Right. Um, what part of manness do you think that speaks to? Um, well, for one, um, I think it made him, I, I, I guess I took the status from the room. He was the performer, but I was the lone figure on the floor watching his talented band, which had no one else watching him except me and my friends. Um, and not saying anything and not attacking and just putting him in a position where he had to explain without me you know, accusing him of anything. That made me feel that, wow, yeah. okay. That I'm taking control of the narrative that this is day one, that it's not me who should be ashamed. It should be, no. it should be yes. them. You know, the other thing that struck me right away, Gabe, about your story is you said, you know, my wife cheated on me and there's nothing, I was such a man and yeah. there's nothing more emasculating than that. And I'm sure that's, you know, true. It was obviously true for you. And... Being cheated on is so universally heartbreaking, right? right? I mean, I can say as a woman, right. being cheated on sucks, yeah. <laughs> right? And I think it can be really um, uh, destructive and debilitating. And, yeah. uh, and so I think there's something so universal about it. Right. And I was... It, so it, it struck me, and, and uh, I don't know what the word is, but there was something sort of heartbreaking about um, the added isolation of hearing you say as a man it was so hurtful yeah uh, uh, we you know? were uh, 
Filipino culture is very, um, well, where our, our roots are very his, Hispanic. So, and you can say things about that culture where, you know, a man, in, in the Philippines, it is not normal for a man not to have a mistress for a certain oh, generation. Yes. You, you know, they have that. Um, so it was almost like a double insult that I yeah. was, <laughs> I was the one. Um, yeah. and, 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 and it, uh, got into even more um, personal insecurities about being sure. small, being, you know, not tall and all of that. So it, it was difficult. Well, I'm so glad that it was a story of triumph. Yeah. And I'm going to now walk around as if I have a gun whenever <laughs> I need one. In the best sense, maybe not. I don't know, in this world. No, no. Maybe not, maybe not. It was a I different world at that time. It was, well, there, you know, I say that now, and I think to myself, wow, we're living in this world, and we have th all of those associations, and now you've even transformed walking around as if I have a gun can now be a secretly positive thing for me, even with all of those terrible associations. So right. look what stories can do. Thank you so Thank much, you. David. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. This is what we want to leave you with. Uh, in the last 10 seconds that we have here with you today, we're going to offer to you that you can go out and dare to be human and seek these moments for yourself and not just have them, but capture them for yourself as stories and share them because it is in the sharing that you give other people not just the courage to have them for themselves, but their permission to go out and have them in the first place. So share them. And please share them with us, uh, email, phone, talk to us in person. We want to hear your stories. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>